In this video, I'm going to be using the second walnut slab that I've ever used. I guess technically it's the second and third walnut slabs, since there's two of them. And the reason there's two is because we're going to make a giant L-shaped desk, which I have done before, just never with slabs. In fact, almost exactly a year ago to the day I made a big L-shaped desk, which was also out of walnut. It's like the more things change, the more they stay the same. So I got these from the same place that I got the last walnut slab, which is a place called GL Veneer. And I was looking through their inventory online, and initially I wanted to get this pair, which were numbered 73 and 74. But unfortunately, before I could claim it, somebody grabbed 73. So instead I got 72 and 74. And I think that basically means that when they were a tree that got turned into slabs, they would have been numbered something like this. So instead of being first cousins, they're second cousins which I don't think will be a problem, unless they want to get married. Anyway, regardless of where you live, anybody can go on GL Veneer's website and browse their inventory, which I highly recommend, by the way. It's fun to dream about some of the crazier pieces they've got. That said, this was the first time that we actually went there in person to pick up slabs and have them flattened, and it's pretty wild. Definitely beats using a random orbit sander. So pretty much the first thing that I like doing on any of these projects is to get rid of all the stuff that I know isn't going to be in the final piece. And that's because pretty much 98% of making a slab top is essentially taking something that's rough and dirty and falling apart and making it smooth, clean, and keeping it together so that it can be a functional table. In other words, removing the bad stuff and cleaning up the good stuff. So if I can remove, say, about 15% of the material right off the bat, then I can save myself probably 15% of the total time that I'm going to spend cleaning things up. And to be completely honest, I don't really have a good handle of how many hours that is. People always ask how long my projects take me, and I feel like I never have a good answer, mainly because since I'm filming everything, it's a lot longer than what it probably should be. But just to take a semi-educated guess, if I weren't filming, something like the hall table from the last video was probably three solid work days for the top, another three for the base, plus another day for touch-up, sanding, and finishing. So I'd say about 60 hours of work. By the way, if you saw that video, then you'll remember that I auctioned that piece off and gave all the money to charity, and we ended up raising $5,000. But that didn't stop somebody from saying that the table should have been worth $300 at most. So 60 hours of work, not including filming and editing, for a table that's worth $300 max. Not counting cost of materials, that means I'm making five bucks an hour. Which actually, my first job ever at a Subway sandwich franchise in 1996, I think that is about what I got. The more things change, the more they stay the same. At this point, all of the cutting that I'm doing is very rough. I'm not trying to hit any finished dimensions or anything like that. Everything's still way oversized, the miters probably aren't 45 degrees. I'm really just getting rid of the stuff that I know I don't need. And that's because, as I said a minute ago, a huge percentage of the time I spend on these slabs is going to be cleaning them up. And on this one in particular, a lot of that time was dedicated to this, what is apparently called a gallery. And this is something that might have started its life as like a pruning wound, and then bugs get in there and attack the area and it turns into a big hole. Now, I seriously consider just taking a hammer to this part of the slab because... Most of it you're never going to see once it's filled with black epoxy. But the reason that I didn't is because I was worried that the overall shape would end up looking really man-made in the end. And I guess I want it to look like it was shaped by bugs and mother nature instead of me. So once that part was clean, then I had to clean up the rest of the slab plus the whole other one. And this takes a long time, so I'm not going to subject you to watching any of it in real time. Except for maybe this one shot just because the setting sun spilling through the roll-up door was too cinematic to just speed through. So for this epoxy pour, I'm not going to be building any forms because there's no major river running through the slabs. It's really just one big lake and a few little ponds. So by using tape and a few strategically placed pieces of melamine, I should be able to get the job done. And you can see in this shot that I was trying to beat the clock to get my epoxy poured, and this was a bad idea. So I reconvened and let things set up overnight, and then got to the pour the next morning. And I did this pour a little differently than how I have in the past. 
So here what I'm mixing up is total boat high performance epoxy with slow hardener. Now even though this stuff is called slow hardener, it's still going to be cured enough that I can keep working on it within a day. So in the pool area, I'm going to start by filling in the bug holes and get just the bottom maybe quarter inch or so of the big open area and then fill in some knot holes and other little bug hole areas as well. Then the next day, I'm going to switch over to deep pour and I'll use that to completely fill up the pool area, top off all the major cracks and get everything else flush with the top. And this stuff is going to take several days to cure enough that I can keep working on it. So you might be wondering why not just use one or the other for the entire pour. And there's a few reasons. With the slow hardener, which remembers the one that actually cures fast, the biggest downside in this situation is that you can only pour it a quarter of an inch deep at a time. One of the advantages of the slow hardener, though, is that even right off the bat, it's quite a bit thicker than deep pour. And also within about an hour, the slow hardener turns into sort of a gel-like consistency, whereas the deep pour is going to stay like water for basically a day. So the way that I sealed these slabs up for the pour, I would say was good, but not great. So if there is a potential for a leak somewhere, by pouring the slow hardener first, it's going to kind of get in there and seal up. And maybe a couple drops will come out. Now in terms of the quality of the finished results, I honestly don't know if one of them really looks any better than the other. But my hunch is that since I'm tinting everything black, and it's pretty opaque, it doesn't really make a difference. Okay, in that last whole section, I was only cleaning up one of the slabs. And the reason for that is the other slab has a really big problem on the underside. And these are two really large shallow spots. And this is probably the reason that slab 73 and 74 both cost over $1,600, while this slab, number 72, was about 400 bucks cheaper. So in this shot, you can see that the shallow spots maxed out at about three quarters of an inch thinner than the rest of the slab. And one solution would have been to build a form and fill this up with epoxy. But I didn't want to do that because this part of the slab is very structural. And you'll see later that a lot of hardware is going to get attached here. And I'd rather have wood for that to go into. So I took a bunch of off cuts of walnut that we had laying around and used my planer to thin them out to about a quarter of an inch. That way they're going to be thin enough to conform to the curvature of the slab. And then I cut those into a bunch of smaller pieces that'll take up like 90% of the area that needs to be filled in. So to initially attach these, I used a light layer of epoxy, and I knew that there was no way that I was going to get them perfectly laminated on. So after the epoxy dried, I came back and drilled in a bunch of, we'll call them access ports. That way when I pour the epoxy, it'll get in everywhere and make a good surface for the infrastructure of the desk. Now, having slab 72 instead of 73 might be something that some people would be upset about, but I'm actually happy about it now. First, because I'm confident that in the end, this isn't going to be a problem, but mainly because I think of the three slabs, this one actually turned out to be the most interesting looking of the bunch. So to the person running the sawmill that day that caused this Happy accident. Thank you. Anyway, from here, next I took them down to Street Tree Revival to throw them up on the wood whiz to get flattened. And if you've never heard of a wood whiz, kind of like me until three months ago, it's basically a slab flattening jig with a router that's on steroids. So at this point, the slabs still don't look very good and they still need a ton of work. But from a structural point of view, we're actually looking pretty good, which means that we can finally start making the critical cuts. And the first of those is going to be the miter joint that's going to join the two slabs together. And after making the first of these cuts, here you can see the result of filling in that huge shallow spot on the miter. And is it pretty? Not really. But is it functional? I think so. And does it really matter if it's pretty? No, because you're not going to see it once the desk is all together. And do you hate it when people ask and answer their own questions in a voiceover because it's annoying? Probably. So will I stop now? Yeah. So with the miters looking good, next I have to cut the slabs to their final widths. And initially I had planned that I was going to do this with the track saw as well, but the slabs actually turned out to be quite a bit lighter than what I thought they would be. So I was able to use my table saw instead to get a more consistent result. 
The next thing that I need to do is use this Domino Connect hardware to attach the slabs together in a non-permanent way. And I do this about once a year, and every time I need to relearn it, and it's kind of a big pain. So if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna use the next minute as a sort of cheat sheet that I can refer to next time. Okay, first up, make sure you're using the eight millimeter bit. Next, mark all the places you're gonna cut mortises along your joint and alternate between regular dominoes and the Connect hardware. Now set the domino cutter to plunge 15 millimeters deep, then cut all the mortises you labeled C on just one of the slabs. Then change the plunge depth to 28 millimeters and cut the mortises labeled C on the other slab. Next, flip the workpiece over so that the bottom is facing up and then use the provided drilling jig to drill holes in the same slab that you would cut the deeper mortises into. Now you can install the metal part of the hardware into the 15 millimeter deep mortises, tapping it flush. Then install the metal block thingy and the plastic clip on the bob into the 28 millimeter deep mortises. Next, install the um, nail part, making sure that the flat spot faces the hole. And then use this little set screw to draw everything tight. Now, if you have any questions, hop in a DeLorean and set the flux capacitor to Sunday, December 20th, 2022 at 8, 11 a.m. West Coast time. This is the best you're ever going to understand this. So find him and ask. Give it here. The reason that we're building this desk in the first place is because a guy named Robert had reached out after seeing our video on this desk and asked if we could build him something similar, only much, much bigger. And obviously we said yes. So after he gave us all of his requirements, here's what we came up with. In my last video, I had tested out buying lumber online for the first time, and that project didn't really require a ton of wood, but this project does. Actually, here's a shot of the little file that I made myself for figuring out how much it needed exactly. So I'm not gonna make any claims yet, but so far, I am liking the convenience of ordering online and having it all show up at my door. And this isn't a sponsorship, but the place that I've been testing is called Woodworkers Source. And for now, I'm going to keep testing them, and I'll update you on my experience as we go. Okay, now it's time to talk about the elephant in the room. So the guy you see building stuff on your screen right now is Sean. I'm Chris. We're two different people. Anyway, in the last few videos, longtime viewers had noticed that they haven't been seeing much Sean, which led to a lot of questions. And I couldn't really talk about it, and honestly, it's really more of his place than it is mine, but I can say a few things. And I guess really the main takeaway would be that Sean is going to be stepping away from the Four Eyes channel to restart his channel. And that might sound dramatic, but really it's not. He's literally sitting three feet away from me right now at his computer. We ate fish tacos for lunch. They were good. So he's still my friend. He's still my business partner on our woodworking plans. There's even a good chance that we'll still collaborate on projects like this from time to time. He just won't be posting on the Four Eyes channel anymore. And really most of that has to do with geography. Basically, there's a good chance that he's going to have to move in the not too distant future. And we don't know when that is, but rather than waiting for it to happen and then scrambling, we figured we'd take a more active approach and get his channel going again. So after this, if you're interested, there's a much more detailed version of this base that you can go check out. And you can hear what he has to say about everything. So probably more than any other single project that I've built, this desk has to be able to come apart and go back together easily and repeatedly. Moving it as one giant piece would take like eight people who were extremely in sync with one another. Otherwise, they'd probably break something. Not to mention that even if that were possible, it's not going to really fit through many doors. So Sean has everything covered in terms of the base, but for the top, I'm going to need to create a series of attachment plates. Now I've made things like this in the past, and here I need to make four identical plates and one similar but slightly different plate at the corner. So rather than standing in front of my drill press for several hours, I decided to sit at my computer for about 30 minutes to drop a file and then spent another hour or so using the CNC to drill out all the holes. Except for these tapered countersinks. Those I did at the drill press. And almost immediately after creating the plates, I had the realization that half of the holes that I made were basically inaccessible because of the desk's cabinets. So then I had to cut off all the holes that we won't be able to get to. Live and learn, I guess. 
So the other day I got a DM from somebody letting me know that they saw someone selling my spider table on Marketplace. So they sent me a link and I took a look and I can't say for sure if this is the spider table. And anyway, this specific example aside, I actually get a lot of messages from people saying, this person is copying your design or this person stole this, yada, yada, yada. And my stance is always good. I make videos about designing and building furniture with the hopes that millions of people will watch them and that some of the people will feel inspired or motivated to go build something. And if that something is completely new and original, inspired by something they saw me build, or a straight-up one-for-one replica of something they saw me build, I'm good with all of that. Actually, I'm more than good with it. I want it to happen. And this is something that I've thought about a lot. And that is the idea of people selling a replica of something that I've designed. And I would say that where I've settled is, as long as it's not a big company doing it, I'm fine with it. This guy selling the spider table, that's fine. Maybe he's trying to get better, and if he can subsidize the cost of furthering his craft by selling this table, that's great. In fact, I think my exact reply after seeing that they were selling it for 450 bucks was, that's a good deal. But he did mess up the standoffs. That's this part right here, by the way. People always want to make them a lot taller, but a little goes a long way. Now, that said, if I woke up tomorrow morning and Ikea had a Four Eyes furniture line, I'd probably feel a little different. I think I'd want in on the action. In fact, if anybody out there from Ikea is watching this and wants to collaborate, Vjorg that. Anyway, I guess this is all a really long way of saying, if you ever want to build anything that you see me building, you don't have to ask. You have my permission. And in fact, I'll make it really easy for you. Here are 14 pieces that we've made insanely detailed instructions for that'll walk you through every single step of building them so that not only will you be successful in building the piece, but you'll learn new skills that you can carry with you for the rest of your woodworking career. In other words, these are our woodworking plans, and I'll have a link in the description. Okay, so at this point, structurally speaking, this desk is a tank. But there is one part that I'm slightly concerned about, and that's this inside corner of the top. So in order to tankify this part, like the rest of the desk, I decided to install a few pieces of C-channel that'll bridge the joint. And by the way, if you ever want to see the ultimate face of concentration, that's it right there. Or maybe that's constipation. Either way. After cutting everything in, just like with the attachment plates, I used my Rockler portable drill guide to install some threaded inserts to attach everything. And if it isn't obvious by now, I'd say this tool is the real star of the show on this build. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's going to be a replacement for a drill press in every situation, but I can truthfully say that I personally spent $1,700 on a drill press that gets used way less than this thing, which only cost one-tenth as much. Though I suppose in fairness, you can't really rank tools by usefulness per dollar. If you did, though, I guess the winner in my book might be a random orbit sander, and the loser might be something like this edge sander. Maybe. I don't know. Might be an interesting thought experiment to ponder someday. But that aside, what I'm doing here is all of the touch-up work on the slab. And I'm using a small nail to try to get as much epoxy down into every little possible hole. But some holes you just can't fill with epoxy. So for those, I'm going to use this stuff called hot melt, which I think is basically like a black glue stick. And even though it's thicker than liquid epoxy is, you can kind of force it down into the little holes and cracks. And I would guess that this stuff isn't nearly as hard as epoxy is, but it's definitely hard enough. You're only going to dent it if you were to stab into it with a screwdriver or something. But also, wood will dent if you stab into it with a screwdriver. So it's fine. Also, possible dark horse in the usefulness per dollar tool tournament, the screwdriver. All right, now, something that is undeniable is that I am an idiot. But I want to know if I'm in the wrong here or if the company is in the wrong. 
So I'm not going to name them because I don't want to throw anybody under a bus. But for this desk, I ordered a two and three quarter inch solid brass grommet. Solid brass. That's how they described it on the website. I wanted brushed, but they didn't have it. But I figured I could brush it myself with some light sanding. Except for when I did that, all the brass came off. So is this solid brass? My guess is no, but I honestly have no idea. Maybe that's just how brass is. But my suspicion is that it's brass plated nickel. So I guess the moral of the story is, if you want a solid brass grommet, make sure it's not just brass plated nickel trying to pull a fast one on you. Otherwise, you might end up brushing your grommet instead of brushing it. Now, if that joke didn't make sense, there's a good reason. It was created by artificial intelligence, and it's not that funny. Yet. Okay, a quick little story. Something I haven't really talked about in a video is about six months ago, I had a little run-in with a router bit, and I got a pretty significant cut on my left thumb. Now, the reason that I bring this up is, I'm sure you've all heard of Cam at Blacktail Studio. Well, a couple weeks ago, he put out a really cool video about woodworking injuries where he captured everything in super slow motion. And in that video, he interviewed me about my experience. And first, I highly, highly recommend watching that video. I will warn you that it's pretty graphic, but it's also a very good reminder. And anyway, Cam, being the nice guy that he is, forwarded me this comment that he received where somebody said how they loved seeing all their favorite woodworkers in one video, except for me. They'd like to see me in a video where guys get punched in the face repeatedly. So I shared that on my socials, and somebody did some internet sleuthing and pointed out that that person subscribes to my channel. And I think there's this small group of losers who do this. They basically sign up for notifications from a channel so that as soon as a video comes out, they can immediately give it a dislike. I can personally tell you that every time I come out with a new video, I'll get like 15 dislikes right off the bat. So normally asking for likes in my videos is not something that I do. But to counteract their dislikes, and as a big f*** you to those people, if you're feeling generous or spiteful, give this video a like. And if you really want to send them a message, hit that subscribe button as well. Thank you. Not to dwell on comments too much, but editing this video together and thinking back to three years ago when Sean joined Four Eyes, in the beginning, we got a lot of comments from people who didn't like it. A lot of kind of anti sean sentiment. And people wishing that he still just posted on his own channel. And now, three years later, it's the exact opposite. It's a lot of people wondering where he's been, saying that they miss him, that kind of stuff. Which I think proves that people never actually hated Sean or preferred one of us over the other. If anything, it just proves that people like familiarity and what they actually hate is change. It's kind of like taking a shower. You'll procrastinate to get in, but once you do and you're nice and warm, you don't want to get out. The thing is, though, at some point, you have to. Otherwise, your fingers are going to turn into prunes. So here we are now. Three years later, and Sean is getting out. Maybe those original commenters finally got their wish. And as the water shallows, and it circles down the drain, the more that things are changing, the more they stay the same. By the way, if that ending seemed kind of weird, it's because... It was an homage to the old Sean videos. He used to always end with a rhyme and then he would lay on the piece of furniture like I'm doing here. Okay, now bye.